Hello and welcome back to the channel. I hope that everybody is doing well today. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I'm a nurse practitioner. Much of what I do here on this channel is educational content for the nurse practitioner and the nurse practitioner student. So this lecture here, I'm going to be talking all about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD for short. This lecture is actually taken from my second mental health lecture from my nurse practitioner board's review. So in the complete lecture, I also discuss autism spectrum disorder or ASD. If you would like to listen to the complete lecture, then make sure that you follow the link in the description box below and join my Patreon under that tier ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Also, please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. It's a free way to show your support and it really means so much to me. All right, so now without further delay, let's talk about ADHD. All right, so first up, I'm going to talk about ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So this is among the most common behavior conditions and it often manifests in childhood with the core features of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Those are the core features of ADHD. Hyperactivity and impulsivity almost always coexist, and they present with symptoms of fidgeting, difficulty staying seated, difficulty waiting turns, difficulty playing quietly. They often engage in excessive talking, possibly interrupting, these symptoms, they generally present around four years of age, and then they become more noticeable over the next three to four years, after which that hyperactivity symptoms, they generally begin to decline. So usually these manifest by age four, over the next three to four years, they tend to peak, and then the hyperactivity starts to wane. However, though, the impulsivity, this tends to be a chronic complication of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Typically, the symptoms of inattention don't manifest until about eight or nine years of age. And children with symptoms of inattention, they often appear to be daydreaming. They can have difficulty with focusing on school or with details. They may have difficulty with organizational skills, difficulty listening, difficulty keeping track of items, and they're often easily distracted. Same as impulsivity, Generally, inattention is also a lifelong chronic symptom of ADHD. So the evaluation for ADHD begins, like I said, at around four years when those symptoms start to manifest. And these must impair functioning in school, social skills, and or their occupational activities in order for them to meet diagnostic criteria. So the evaluation of a child that has potentially ADHD they must be evaluated and observed in various settings. This includes the home, the school, social settings. These symptoms are not only present in one setting, but in all settings. And so let's talk exactly about how we diagnose a patient with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So the DSM, they provide us diagnostic criteria for ADHD. So for children that are less than 17 years of age, they need to have six or more symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity or six or more symptoms of inattention. And then for individuals that are 17 years and older, they need to have five or more symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity or five or more symptoms of inattention. And that is what's required for the diagnosis. And so you can see here on the slide, I listed the symptoms here, much of which I went over on that previous slide, but you can see the list of hyperactivity and impulsivity symptoms, and then also symptoms of inattention. And then remember, if they're less than 17 years, they need six or more symptoms. And if they're greater than 17 years, they need five or more symptoms. So there are other tools that are also used to help in this diagnostic process of our patients with ADHD. Couple examples here, there is the Connors Comprehensive Behavior Rating Scale, there is the ADHD Rating Scale as well. I included links to both of those on the page, so you can actually like copy and paste those and follow 
um, and you can pull them up and you can take a look at them. I didn't want to include them here on the screen for copyright issues, but I included the link where you can find them and you can take a look at them. And these are just other tools that help with screening and assessing these patients with ADHD. It's important to note too that certain neurodevelopmental conditions can actually mimic ADHD as well. So for example, certain learning disorders um, and autism spectrum disorders, which actually I'll talk about on the next topic, but these can mimic ADHD. In addition, uh, there's many different emotional behavioral disorders that can misrepresent ADHD as well. So anxiety, um, various mood disorders. So for example, uh, bipolar, OCD, even PTSD, all of these can mimic. And so it's really important that we are doing a very thorough exam and we're narrowing down the differential and confirming that it is actually ADHD and not one of these other disorders or conditions that I just talked about now. So treatment options for these patients include psychosocial interventions, pharmacotherapy, educational interventions, alone or in combination with one another. And generally, this can be managed by the primary care provider alone in patients between 4 years and 18 years old that do not have any comorbidities. If the child or the adolescent does have coexisting psychiatric conditions, neurological conditions, medical conditions, or if the person is having an inadequate response to the attempts of treatment, then a referral is definitely indicated. And it's also important that the caregiver and patient remain very involved in the treatment attempts as well. So in children four and five years old, it's recommended that we begin with parent or caregiver training in behavior management or PTBM for short. We can do this alone. This is what's recommended is to start with this alone. And then we can add on medication if it's unsuccessful as a monotherapy. For children less than six years that do end up requiring um, medication or pharmacotherapy, it's recommended that they're actually co-managed with a specialist. So less than six years old, they really need to be referred. For most children and adolescents that are greater than six years with ADHD, medication rather than behavioral therapy alone is the first line treatment. So four and five years, it's recommended that we start with that behavior training and then we add on medication if necessary, but in that circumstance, then we're referring them to a specialist. Six and older, we, it's recommended that we begin with medication rather than just behavioral therapy alone. Generally, a stimulant is the first line treatment for confirmed ADHD, and this is because we have a long history of studies on its efficacy and its fast-acting onset. However, we do also use the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or those SNRIs. Two examples that we use for this would be a atomexetine, also known as Stratera. There's also another one here called Veloxazine, which I haven't really seen, but those are alternative options. A Tomexetine, this, like I said, is sold under that brand name Stratera, and it's becoming increasingly more popular in use. Because it's an SNRI, though, it's not a stimulant, it's not a controlled substance, and so it's much less likely for abuse. However, stimulants have shown to be more effective in treating the symptoms of ADHD, but it is an alternative. And it's important to note that SNRIs, these are contraindicated with the cur concurrent use of the MAOIs. And that's really imp important if they're either taking a drug from this class or if they've discontinued one within the last 14 days, it is contraindicated. So they cannot be on MAOIs when taking SNRIs, and it has to be greater than 14 days from the last time they took their MAOI. So for available stimulants, there are short-acting and long-acting stimulants. So methylphenidate, dexmethylphenidate, amphetamines, and dextroamphetamine, these all have short-acting options available. Um, and then these agents, they have had significant research. They do have generic formulations available. However, because they are short acting, they have to be taken two, sometimes three times a day if coverage is going to be needed all day long. For preschool children that do end up requiring pharmacotherapy, the short acting stimulant methylphenidate is the preferred option. And then 
methylphenidate, amphetamines, and those SNRIs that we just talked about, these all are long-acting or have long-acting options available. These can be given just one time a day, and they have the benefit of not needing to dose at school, which is always a plus. However, there, there are less generic options available, and they tend to be more expensive. Before we begin pharmacotherapy for the patients, certain criteria have to be met to ensure the safety of the patient. So that's confirming the diagnosis, using that diagnostic criteria from the DSM, confirming that the child is six years or older, otherwise we're having them managed or co-managed by a specialist. The caregiver is accepting an understanding of the treatment and its involving of medication. The school is on board with monitoring the patient or administering the medication if dosing is required during school hours. Uh, the child has no known sensitivity to the medication. The child does not have any significant anxiety. And substance abuse is not of concern regarding the patient or members of the household. Also, it's important to note that if the child has a history of seizures, Tourette syndrome, or if they have significant developmental delay, they, these patients also need to be co-managed with a specialist. So when beginning a medication for ADHD, it's usually titrated to the desired dose over one to three months, and it requires weekly monitoring by the prescriber. A good choice is to begin these medications on a weekend day. That way the child can be home, you know, from school, maybe from activities, and they can be monitored really closely by their family in their own home. Stimulants, they need to be started at the lowest dose, and they're increased every three to seven days until symptoms are improved by an estimated about 40 to 50 percent. And this can be estimated using these ADHD screening tools that I listed before, and it can be completed by both caregivers and teachers, you know, assessing and monitoring the patient. Once that optimal medication and dosing have been established for the patient, it's recommended then to have regular follow-up. Generally, every three to six months is the preferred follow-up. If the patient does have adverse effects, so for example, if they're experiencing suicidality or psychosis, first make sure that you're checking the dosing, make sure that they're not overdosing the medication. Um, also, though, you can, of course, discontinue the stimulant, and this can be done so without tapering if needed.